Last week we talked about something that is very foreign to people who live in a very physical world. We talked about a thing called spiritual warfare. How Paul tries to help us understand that when we become believers, that what we do is automatically we incur the wrath of the one that stands in opposition to what God is trying to do. The one who would like to himself be called Lord of our lives, that is the one that we know as the devil or Satan, and that he and his forces then come against us for the purpose of doing primarily three things. It says the thief comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And what he wants to do is this. He would love to come in and to kill our witness that we have of the beauty and the glory and the wonder of a God who has created us and loves us so much that he would send Jesus to be the sacrifice for our lives so that we might know him. He would like to kill whatever witness we have to stop it in its tracks. And so to do that, he would bring things against our lives that would cause us to become sidetracked or cause us to lose our focus or to cause us to become so beaten down or to become so fearful that we can't do what God has given us the gifts to do or has called us to do or wants us to do as his people. He also comes to steal. What he comes to steal is our joy and our peace because you're not a very good or a very effective witness of God's love if you don't have joy and peace in your life. I mean, it's kind of hard to talk about a God who has the power to change life if your life isn't changed. Or if you're struggling just like everyone else with no different attitude and no different positioning than they have in the rest of the world, and then you talk about a God who really makes a difference and helps you get through the days, and they look at your life and you have no peace or no joy, and they say, well, I sure don't want that. So he comes to steal our joy, our peace, so that we cannot be effective in sharing with others the good news of the love of God. He also comes to destroy. He comes to destroy us if we can, but primarily he comes to destroy our relationships. He comes to destroy the unity that people have. He comes to separate us and to divide us and to cause us to feel like we are isolated and alone and no one understands us and no one really cares and that we somehow stand by ourselves. And when we have that feeling, then we feel that we've been cut off from life and cut off from the body and cut off from God and somehow God has abandoned us. That's a lie, but that's what the enemy tries to do to us. Now, in all that battle, what Paul says, especially in Ephesians, is he calls us to stand in battle, to stand in warfare. All right, Paul says in this letter, he says, we're in a battle against an enemy who would destroy us. And the reason he would destroy us is because we become the children of God. But God does not send us unequipped into this battle. God gives us what we need in order to withstand the onslaughts that come against us in our lives. It's not that God just simply says, okay, now there's going to be a spiritual war. You're on your own. Now just hold fast and hold tight and just hang on for the best that you can. Instead, he says, I will equip you with all that you need to fight this spiritual battle. These are the weapons that God provides. And that's what Paul's writing about in this letter to the Ephesians. He's writing about what we often call the armor of God and we talk about the weapons of God. But you'll notice one thing that Paul does not say that we have or that we are to do. And he says that in the battles that we fight, and whether those battles come to us through opposition of other people, whether they come to us through persecution, whether they come to us through financial difficulties or medical or health problems or whatever it may be that's coming to try to steal our joy and to destroy our witness as children of God, whatever it may be, it doesn't really matter. God provides the necessary weapons. We are to never pick up the weapons of the enemy. We are to never pick up and use the weapons of the enemy as a defense as long as we are God's children. 
Now, what are the weapons of the enemy? We want to compare today. The weapons of the enemy are things like gossip, backbiting, slander. We don't want to use the weapons of the enemy that would involve manipulation or control of people. These are not God's ways. I mean, God doesn't even control our lives except when we give him the right to control our lives. He who is a creator of the world doesn't just step in and say, well, whether you like it or not, I'm going to make you a Christian. Or whether you like it or not, I'm going to make you do this or make you do that. God instead gives us the option of obeying him or not obeying him. He gives us the freedom of choice, the right to make decisions that God who has all power extends to us the ability to make our own decisions. And yet the enemy would say, no, the way to get what you want is to control. The way you get what you want is to manipulate. And if they're coming against you, then use their weapons against them, undermine their character, talk about them, hate them and get even with them, get revenge. Those are the weapons of the enemy. Paul says very clearly, the weapons that we use in the spiritual warfare are not the weapons of this world, the way the world would deal with opposition or deal with problems. Our weapons, he says, belong to God. They are the armor of God. They are the weapons of God. They are the methods of God. We use his weapons because you see, when we pick up the enemy's weapons, when we decide we're going to use gossip to get even, or when we decide that we're going to use manipulation or control of people's lives to get what we want, then what we do is we open up our lives to the enemy and give him a right to deal with our lives and to use us as his pawns in his games. And we're not supposed to be used by the enemy for anything. We are God's children. And if we have given our lives over to Jesus Christ, it says through him, he gave us the power to become sons and daughters of God. And as sons and daughters of God, I don't want anything that belongs to the enemy of my father. I don't want his attitude. I don't want his ways. I don't want anything that belongs to him, even if it may appear that it would benefit me. I don't want it. I want what my father has. I want my father's gifts because his gifts not only are strong and more powerful than anything that the enemy has, but his gifts build me up. They strengthen me. They produce joy in me. They give me peace so that when I use what God has provided for me and when I approach problems and difficulties in life, not using the weapons of the enemy, but instead using what God provides then not only do I come out victoriously, but I come out joyfully victoriously. I don't just get my way. In fact, I may not get my way because it's not my way that matters. It's God's way that matters. Not only do I get what's best, but I get blessed in the process when I use what God has provided. So the spiritual battles that we fight as believers in this world against a very real enemy, are never to be fought using the enemy's techniques. In fact, that's the way Paul begins this passage of Scripture. Ephesians 6.10 says, Therefore, brothers, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. It's not our power. We don't have the strength. Paul says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood but against powers and principalities. Now, last week, we talked about what that wrestling match was like. It was a no-holds-barred, anything-goes, hurt your enemy any way you can, gouge eyes or produce injury any way that you can produce injury. That was the Greek form of wrestling to which Paul was referring. If you can kill your enemy, kill him. Any way to defeat him. And he said, that's the kind of battle we're engaged in with this enemy who is really the adversary. That's what the word Satan means, the adversary, the, the one who is an obstacle. And so we're in this battle, and he says, we wrestle not. Now, there was one aspect of the wrestling that I left off last week. I decided for 
decency's sake, I really wouldn't mention it. But I find that it really is important to mention the wrestling done in the Greek arena when two opponents would face each other intending to maim or destroy each other was done without clothing. The wrestlers were naked as they, re as they faced each other. Now, that's important in understanding spiritual warfare because, you see, on our own, we stand defenseless against the enemy. We do not have power over him in and of ourselves. I do not have the wisdom to fight the spiritual battles. I'm not smart enough to know how to overcome the problems that face me. I don't know how to defeat the enemy who would bring all sorts of temptations in my way. I can try on my own. I can use my own skills and abilities, but it's as though I stand before him naked and vulnerable. And it's for that very reason that it says, therefore, put on the armor of God. God will clothe you with what you need to fight the battle. You don't have the power in yourself. You don't have the strength in yourself. You don't have the ability in yourself to know the right decisions for your life or to know how to deal with the problems that come your way. None of us does. And that's why it says, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. That's the one thing that God says. God recognizes that as mere creatures created on this earth, we do not have the power in and of ourselves to avoid sin, to keep from offending God, to keep from doing things that are wrong. It is our very human, fleshly nature to do those things. We can't keep from doing what's wrong. We can try, but we're inevitably, we're going to make mistakes. So he says, where do you turn? You turn to the Lord. Because he will give you the wisdom to fight the battle. He will give you the strength to face what needs to be faced. He will show you what to say and how to say it so that it defeats the enemy but does so without using the enemy's weapons. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. The church, this organization, this body of Christ, this group of believers moves forward in battle, and as Jesus said, the gates of hell cannot stop the church. There's going to be a conflict, but the reason it can't stop the church is because we're not marching in our own power. We're marching with the authority and the power of God. Now, I don't just imagine what I can do, and then I say it myself, and then, okay, I've got the power of God, so I can just go out and do whatever I want to do, or I can do it any way I want to do it. No. If you've ever been in military, now, I wasn't, so I'm speaking not as, a, not as an eyewitness here, but I know enough about the military. When you join the military, you come under authority, and you obey orders. The whole purpose of boot camp in the military is to teach you that if you want to survive, you better learn how to be part of a team and follow orders. Because there are going to be times when an order is given and your life and the lives of others are going to depend upon your obedience. You don't have time to stop and say, now I'm not sure I agree with that order. There are going to be times when you've got to obey and you've got to obey quickly. Now, if we do that in the human arena, how much more so in the divine arena, in the spiritual arena? When God, who knows everything, says, for your sake, do this, and we are to be obedient. That's why, as an army of God, we do not march under our own authority, but we march under the authority of God. It is His armor, His weapons. He is the commander. He tells us how to fight the spiritual battles of our lives. If we try to do it on our own wisdom, we will fail. But if we do it, rely upon Him, we will be victorious. Now, I will say this over and over. Being victorious in spiritual warfare does not mean getting what I want in life. It means getting what God wants in life. Now, my prayer should be, Lord, make my wants what you want. Make it so that when I want something, it's what you really want, not what I selfishly want for myself. Let my heart, my mind be so transformed so conformed to Jesus that what I want out of life is what God would want for me. Then when I'm obedient, I don't have to stop and say, well, was that my idea or was that the Lord's? Because if my heart is to want to do what God wants, then 
I have to trust that he's going to lead me in the way that he wants me to go. Now, God says, or Jesus says to us, that as we go obediently, now this is the key, obediently, we go with his authority and his power. Now, I don't think any of us really understands that too well. We think of power. Oh, in other words, I can do miracles. Is that what you're talking about? You know, no, maybe. But I mean, that's not exactly what I'm talking about. I want us to understand something about authority and power because these two words are used throughout Scripture. And we need to understand what they mean because they have to do with our spiritual battle against the things that would come against us that would beat us down and cause us to become more and more like the world and less and less like Jesus. There are two words that Jesus uses. He says, all authority and power under heaven and earth has been given to me. Now, authority means the right to rule, the right to act. If you have authority, that means you have the right to do what you are doing. To act without authority means you're acting against your orders. To act under authority means as you have been instructed, you are to do and you have the right to do it. So when Jesus said, all authority has been given to me, he means there, the right to rule has been given to me. I have the right to rule over the world and over life, especially over your lives. And then he says, and power. Now, the power is a Greek word dunamis. We get the word dynamo from it. It means the ability to carry out what you set forth to do the ability to see it through, the ability to accomplish, the ability, the strength, the literal strength to do what you say. Now, what did Jesus say when he said, all, all authority and power is given to me? He said, I have been given by the Father the right to rule, and I have the power to back it up. When I say something, it's going to happen because I have the power to back it up. Now, if then he says to us, I give you my authority and power. I give you the authority to go in my name. That means with, with my approval, with the right to act on my behalf. It's like this. If I came to you this morning and I said, greetings in the name of the governor of the great state of Kentucky. And you look at me and say, you don't know the governor of the state of Kentucky. What do you mean greetings? What you have to say has no meaning at all. But if the governor of the Commonwealth of Kentucky was a personal friend of mine or a person that I worked with, and he said to me, John, I want you to go and bear greetings in my name. Then if I came to you and said greetings in the name of the governor, you would know that what I said was what the governor had authorized me to say. And you know it would have meaning. When a messenger went in the name of the king, that meant that the king's power would back up what that messenger had to say. So that if people didn't want to listen to the messenger, they were, in effect, not listening to the king. Because if they knew the messenger belonged to the king and was sent by the king, then the messenger had the authority to make the declarations that were to be made. He had the right to do it and to use the name. And the power of the king would back him up. A policeman stands in front of an automobile and he holds out his hands, he blows his whistle, and he motions, stop. The automobile comes to a stop. Why? Not because the man has the physical power to stop the car. If that car didn't stop, guess what would happen? We have an expression. It's called road pizza. In other words, the policeman would get run over. He can't physically stop that car. But why does that car stop? Because he has authority. And the power of the law enforcement agency is backing him up. And that driver knows if I violate the law... I don't have just this one man to deal with. I've got the whole law enforcement agency backing him up, and they have more guns than I have. <laughs> you see, that's the way power and authority work. And that's the way God equips us for spiritual battle. He says, I give you power over the power of the enemy. So when the enemy comes trying to tempt you, you've got a power greater. You have the power to say no. You have the power to say no and stick to it. He cannot override 
your decision, only you can override your decision. I give you power over the power of the enemy. If the enemy says, I'm going to steal your joy, all you have to do is say, no, you will not steal my joy. No, you will not stop me from witnessing. No, you will not take away my happiness. You will not destroy me. And what we're doing is we're standing in the authority that has been given to us and the power of God backs up what we are saying. Now, let me tell you something. That's more powerful than anything that we could understand. That has greater power than anything we could conceive in our world. We think of military power. We think of nuclear power. We think of um, solar power. We got all different kinds of power. No kind of power can compare to the power of God. Sometimes we get fearful and we think, oh, I'm standing all alone. If we could just see the presence of God standing there with us, then all of a sudden nobody would shake us. Have you ever, you've seen it. Maybe have even shown it to you before, but I know it's, it's like the little child who's being bullied by someone. And he's cowering in fear and all of a sudden big brother comes walking up and stands beside him. And he looks over and he sees his big brother and all of a sudden he starts puffing up and says, say that again. Why? Because he knows he's got someone there who has greater strength who can take care of the enemy. That's what Jesus talks about. That's what Paul is talking about. He says, in the battles that we fight, we do not stand alone, but we have a big brother standing next to us who is more than able, able to defeat that enemy if we would just turn and say, this is your battle, it is not mine, I will be faithful to you. That's obedience, and out of that obedience, that's where real authority and power come from. Now, what is that power? What is that authority? The centurion came to Jesus. And the centurion said, I have a servant. Now, this centurion, he's not a Jew. This guy, he is, he is a Roman centurion. He's a pagan. And he says to Jesus, I have a servant who is sick. I'm asking you that you would heal him. And Jesus said to him, okay, I'll come to your house and I'll heal him. And he said, no, no, that's not necessary. He said, I understand authority. I am a man under authority. I have a Roman Senate who gives me authority. And because I have their authority backing me up, I can say to this soldier, you come here and he has to come. Or I say to that soldier, you go there and he goes. Because he knows that if he doesn't obey me, he doesn't just have to deal with me. He's got to deal with all those above me who have given me authority. He said, I'm under authority and I know what authority is. And he says, I see you have authority. All you have to do is say the word and it's going to happen. And Jesus said, this is true faith. This man understands. This man knows what authority is about. He understands that I have the authority of the Father backing me up. And then when I send you out, I send you out with my authority backing you up. So that you have the power to act in my name. To do what we want? No. To be obedient servants of the Lord to be obedient children of the Lord, to act as God would act himself, to act with mercy and with kindness, with love and with gentleness, with all the qualities of Jesus. And now people are saying, well, that's nice if you're dealing with spiritual problems, but my problems are physical. You know, I, I, I'm having a pain over here in my leg or, or I, I've got these recurring headaches or, or we're having this financial problem we just can't seem to get ahead. These are real problems. They're not just spiritual problems. I know God can deal with spiritual problems, but my problems are real. Well, let me tell you something. What do you think the miracles of Jesus were all about? Jesus performed miracles showing that the spiritual authority of God had power over physical reality. Jesus healed the sick, showing that the power of God had recreative power over physical existence. Jesus was able to abrogate the, the laws of nature. He walked on water. His very appearance changed once so that he began to shine and began to glow in the presence of some of his disciples. Jesus could speak to the wind or to the waves and cause them to cease. But you see, Jesus knew 
that what he had to do was deal with the source of the problem, not just the examples. The, the, the power of God had power over the physical, but the real source of problem was not the physical problem. The real source of the problem was spiritual. Do you remember the time that Jesus was in the boat and his disciples are rowing and they hit this big storm? They're all their way over to Gagasa on the, on the uh, eastern coast or the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And they hit this big storm. And his disciples wake him up. He's been asleep in the boat. And his disciples wake him up and they say, Master, we're going to die. Do something. We're going to die. I mean, don't you care? And Jesus gets up and says, Where is your faith? Notice what he did next. Now, these waves are splashing the boat. They're about to sink the boat. The waves are enormous. Jesus ignored the waves. Jesus dealt with the source of the problem. It says in Scripture, he rebuked the wind, and then he said to the waves, peace, be still. He dealt with the source of the problem first. He had power over the physical, but he realized that often that physical is only the manifestation of the problem, that the real assault is a spiritual assault because it's coming to destroy you, to beat you down. I said that Satan's trap is like this. The first thing he does, he puts big uh, potholes in front of us, hoping we'll step in. You know, those are the temptations. Lust and, and desire for this and desire for that. Because if we fall in that pothole, now we've got to spend all our time trying to get out of the mud and the mire ourselves, you know, and we haven't got time to witness. We're trying to clean up our own lives. But if we successfully, with the Lord's help, negotiate our way through that little minefield and those potholes that are waiting there to entrap us, then comes the mortar barrage, financial difficulties, relational problems, health problems. Start bound. And the whole purpose is to get us to focus our attention on ourselves and forget about God, take our eyes off of Him and say, oh, what's the use? I can't do it. See, that's the attack. And what Jesus recognized was the power of God can change physical situations, but more importantly, the power of God goes right to the source of the problem. It deals with the spiritual nature of the problem. And once the spiritual cause of the problem is taken care of, then you don't have to worry so much about what's going to happen in terms of the physical. It'll work its way out. In the fire department, we learn. That when you go into a house fire, you don't spray water over here on this little hot spot over here, that little hot spot. You go to the source of the heat. You get rid of the source of the problem first, and then you take care of the little spots here and there. Not the little flare-ups, but you get rid of the source of the heat. You ventilate to let that heat out. You spray water on that major blaze to knock it down. You get rid of the source of the problem first, then cleaning up is a simple process. Our battle is not physical. Our battle is spiritual. Yes, physical things will sometimes happen. And sometimes they're not connected with a spiritual assault because sometimes bad hat things happen to good people. But what happens is the spiritual equipment that God gives us gives us the strength to stand whether it is an assault of the enemy or whether it's just one of those flukes of life that come against his people. It doesn't matter because I have the strength to withstand and I have the strength to do what needs to be done. The source of my strength, the source of our strength, lies in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Not in some formula, not in some words, but in our personal relationship with Jesus. For the closer that relationship grows, the stronger we are in battle. The greater strength we have to stand when the enemy does come. God does not send us weaponless into the battle. But he equips us with his presence, his peace, and his power to do everything that needs to be done in his name.